I now ask His Royal Highness Crown Prince Håkon and Professor Michael Cook to come up to the podium where the Crown Prince will present this year's Holberg Prize, the Holberg Medal. Your Royal Highness, Crown Prince Hawken, Minister, Mayor, members of the Holberg Board and the Holberg, Holberg Committee, colleagues, family, and friends. I don't know how the Holberg Board reached its, its decision to award me this extraordinary honor. And in any case, I ought not to know. But let me invoke a distinction that I'm not the first winner of this prize to make. It stands to reason that implicitly or explicitly, the board must have decided two things. First, they must have decided that whatever it is that I do, I do it possibly well. <laughs> On that decision, the only comment I can offer is the one that I made to Professor Ivar Blakely when he called me to tell me that I had been awarded the prize. I don't know what I have done to deserve this. The other decision the board must have taken is that the kind of thing I do or try to do is worth doing. And on this, I do have something I can say. And in essence, it is that the kind of thing that I do though very much a part of the humanities, is by no means in the mainstream of the humanities, and that I deeply appreciate the fact that the Holberg Board has looked beyond the mainstream. But here I have to ask myself a question that I have a hard time answering. Just what exactly is it that I do or try to do? Now, of course, a large part of this question is easily answered. I work on the history of the Islamic world, or you could say I work on Islam in history, and I will come back to that. But how do I go about it? Now, in attempting to answer this question, I feel distinctly out of my element. And partly I can blame this on culture, on the reticence of properly brought up English people when it comes to talking about themselves. But a lot of it is more personal. It's a profound laziness sustained over many decades in thinking about myself. In other words, I put a lot of energy into thinking about the things I have worked on, but almost none into standing back and watching myself working on them. And on the rare occasions when I've been called upon to do that in the past, I have managed to fob people off by stringing together a few reminiscences and deflecting any deeper questions with attempted witticisms. Well, this time, it's different. This time, I will indeed start with some reminiscences, but I will skip the attempted witticisms. So let me begin with an experience that probably isn't really as significant as I like to think, but I'm very attached to it. This is my earliest attempt to be what I would now call a historian. And by that I mean to reconstitute the past from the fragmentary evidence that survives from it. But this venture was actually a venture in archeology. span I should explain that during my childhood, 
I must have been at the time about as old as my grandson over there, during something like uh, eight. During my childhood, my father was involved in running an excavation on the site of old Smyrna, a few miles north of the modern Turkish city of Izmir. And in excavations, many problems arrive, and at one point, two problems arose. The first was that they were excavating a house dating from the seventh century BC. And this house had one very small room, so small that an adult Turkish workman with his pickaxe simply couldn't fit in there. He bumped his elbows on the walls. And the other problem was me. I was running around being a nuisance. So somebody, probably my father, but quite possibly my mother, had the brilliant idea of solving these two problems together. So they equipped me with a little child-sized pickaxe, and they put me in this room to dig it out. And out of that room emerged the fragments of an ancient clay bath. And the fragments were sub subsequently reassembled by Stelios, our Greek pot mender, till the bath was almost as good as new. And then they put me in it and took my picture. And I think that in terms of reconstituting the past from the fragments that survive, that was the high point of my career. <laughs> from then on, it has been downhill all the way. <laughs> but that experience left me with a very concrete notion of what it is to reconstitute the past. There was nothing about that big, thick clay bath that invited deconstruction. <laughs> well, a few years on, I was 12 years old and being educated at the Edinburgh Academy in Scotland. And what sticks most vividly in my mind six decades later is the very unusual introduction we were given to science. And I mean science in the Anglo-Saxon sense. We got it from our chemistry teacher, Mr. Booth. So at the beginning of the term, Mr. Booth walked in and told us that we were going to study combustion. And he asked us uh, what we thought happened when things burnt. And of course, none of us had the faintest idea what was going on. So he then went to the blackboard and he set out the old 18th century theory of combustion, the phlogiston theory. And we, of course, wrote it all down faithfully, word for word, and we believed it. But at that point, Mr. Booth said, he explained that in science, just writing something down and believing it is not good enough. You have to do experiments to test your theory. So, well, we did an experiment, and the phlogiston theory passed with flying colors. But Mr. Booth said one experiment was not enough. We had to do another. And the second, on the second experiment, the phlogiston theory fell flat on its face. And Mr. Booth then told us about the oxygen theory. We wrote that down. We did a couple of experiments, and it passed both. And I've believed it ever since. <laughs> Well, the immediate result of this imaginative teaching was that I was absolutely certain that I was going to be a scientist, probably a physicist, and which reminds me of what Terry Lundahl was just saying. And it was, in fact, several years before I was disabused of this notion that I was made to be a scientist. And in fact, a crucial role there was played by my maths teacher at Clifton College in Bristol, Mr. Unwin, who did not suffer fools gladly. And one day, Mr. Unwin took a very hard look at me, and he told me, as a mathematician, you're all right, but you're nothing special. And the next day, I became a historian. But the reason I'm telling you all this is that I don't think that my years as a would-be scientist were just an irrelevant detour. I think that for better or worse, they left me with a certain cast of mind. And I find it hard to sum up this cast of mind, but for sure, at an abstract level, it included a disposition to take things like verification and causality rather seriously. 
and also perhaps an inkling of the mathematician's sense of elegance. But, I mean, how can I best sum up the practical implications of this mindset? Well, I once, I'm told this, I don't remember it, but I'm told by reliable authorities that I once shocked a room full of American graduate students by saying, I don't have a methodology, I'm British. <laughs> <laughs> But let me try to pick out three things about the cast of mind I'm talking about just by way of example, though they're rather trite examples of something that in the end I think has more to do with the workings of intuition. First here comes a strong sense that one of the highest forms of intellectual achievement is simplification. I mean, the insight that I always yearn to have is one that reduces chaos to order. I remember how, as a teenager, when I was still going to be a scientist, I was thrilled to learn about the periodic table. I learned about it not in school, but through secret reading that I did at home. I learned about the periodic table, and it thrilled me because of the way in which it took the chemical properties of elements that looked like chaos and made elegant sense of them. And I think Ever since then, I've been looking for periodic tables in all the research I've done, usually with notable lack of success. But this does mean that I have no sympathy for my graduate students when they congratulate themselves on having made things more complicated. I mean, sometimes, of course, making things more complicated is the only thing that you can honestly do. And in that case, you have to do it. But intellectually, this means that you have failed, not that you have succeeded. So that's one example. Another example is an aspiration to think outside the box. The suspicion that if what is inside the box makes no sense, then there must be something somewhere outside it that I'm missing. And I suppose the simplest, a simple form of this is when you're confronted with a box full of chaos and you ask yourself, what is conspicuously not present in the box? What is not happening in this situation that you might expect to happen? And sometimes that works for me. And then third and last is a desperate need to achieve lucidity. Uh, and to be perfectly frank, my default mental state is one of fog and I find fog very dispiriting. I mean, there are people, I know many people, who think with effortless lucidity, but I don't have the good fortune to be one of them. And of course, there are also people who have not the slightest interest in being lucid. And at least in my own view, fortunately, I'm not one of them either. So achieving lucidity, or at least some measure of lucidity, is for me a kind of a breakthrough each time it happens. It's one of those things that reliably gives me a high. But what, you might ask, has any of this to do with the study of Islam in history? Well, of course, one major point here is that my non-Western choice of field puts me at some distance from the traditional mainstream of the humanities. Although much less so today than when I began my career, when I read history, as an undergraduate at Cambridge. History meant English and European history. To the virtual exclusion of the Celtic fringe on the Western side, or of the non-Western fringe as it then appeared on the Eastern side. You had to pursue the career of Alexander the Great or the epic of the Crusades if you wanted to learn anything about the history of even Western Asia in Cambridge in 1960. Today, I'm not really quite sure how far the Celtic fringe has come in from the cold, but for sure, the non-Western world is no longer a fringe. It now has a significant presence in its own right in any respectable history department, even, I'm glad to say, at my alma mater of Cambridge. But what did the cast of mind that I've tried to, stretch, to, to sketch 
have to do with the study of the kind of history I've been doing to which religion is central. And when forced to think about this, I realize that there's something distinctly odd here. The cast of mind I brought to the field was, I think, obviously appropriate for my first serious research project. I was using the Ottoman archives in an attempt to provide a quantitative answer to a question about changing population pressure in rural Anatolia in the 15th and 16th centuries. And then many years later, I noticed that when DNA studies began to have implications for his, uh, the reconstruction of history, I found this new field fascinating, whereas many people in the humanities rather seemed to want it to go away. And yet more recently, I've spent uh, some time thinking about uh, something I'll be talking about in Oslo tomorrow, uh, what I call the long-term geopolitics of the pre-modern Middle East. Um, this is an, an attempt to make sense of the way resources and state formation have played out in the region over the last 2,000 years or so. And what all these enterprises have in common is that they are totally religion blind. It doesn't matter whether the people in question are Muslims, Christians, pagans, Buddhists, or whatever. But those projects are not, in fact, the core of the work that I've been doing in the last few decades, which is very much about the role of Islam in history. I didn't start there, I got there. And I got there thanks to Albert Hurani, a major scholar of modern Middle Eastern studies who was at Oxford. And one year, and he was very good at taking an interest in the careers of young scholars. And one year he was on leave from Oxford and he asked me to stand in for him and give a series of undergraduate lectures on the early centuries of Islamic history. And that was a field that at that point I knew very little about. But it was, as the Americans say, a challenge and I took it up, and soon I was hooked. I was hooked by the role played by religion in the formation of the Islamic world. Now, a shift of interest in itself is nothing special. People's interests change all the time. But my new interest in the role of religion was, I think, it coincided with a wider shift in the humanities, which was a shift towards the subjective, the perceived, the constructed. And I think in that context, in a way, the natural way for me to have proceeded would have been to go with these new trends in the humanities that were then beginning to appear. You know, the kind of trends that um, we often lump together loosely but conveniently under the umbrella of postmodernism. But I didn't, in fact, go that way. And the truth really is that those trends left me cold. Instead, I approached the role of Islam in history with the mindset that I'd already developed, a mindset much more obviously at home in different kinds of history. Not that I did, did this inflexibly, but it's what I did. And I think that for better or worse, that disparity, and you might want to call it a mismatch, underlies the work I have done on Islam in history. It very likely accounts in some ways for the things that people like about my work and also for the things that people dislike about it. In short, if I have any kind of talent, that one talent which is death to hide, as Milton put it, it is somehow linked to this disparity. But of course, this simple variation on C.P. Snow's famous two cultures was far from being a foundation for a career in itself. I've also enjoyed a very large measure of good fortune. As you already know, I was fortunate in my family background. I was fortunate in my teachers. Uh, I've already referred to some of them, but I should add my teachers at Cambridge, uh, which included the ancient historian Moses Finley, who was a very unusual figure to have in an English classics department at that time. I was fortunate also in the friends and contemporaries of my student days from whom I learned enormously. People like John Donne, who after reading history became a political philosopher, and Frank Stewart, 
who left history to, to become an anthropologist with a very strong interest in linguistics, the austere discipline recognized in this year's Nils Klim Award. I was also fortunate in those who gave me the only two jobs that I've ever had. Bernard Lewis, who gave me my lectureship at the School of Oriental and African Studies in London, and Avram Yudovich and Roy Motahede, who brought me to Princeton, an institution without which my career would have been far less rewarding than it has been. I was also fortunate in a student whom I taught in my very first year as a lecturer and with whom I later collaborated and from whom I have never stopped learning, Patricia Croner. I was fortunate in the benevolent interest of Albert Hurani in my early career, who as you know, as you know, he led me into my fascination with the formation of the Islamic world. I was singularly fortunate in my wife Kim, whom I met at Princeton, and whose love, support, and brisk management style I have come to depend on over the years in more ways than I care to, care to name. And I should mention that I'm getting myself into trouble because she wanted me to censor that reference to her management style. <laughs> and I was also, in a way, fortunate that the salience of Islam in the formation of a new civilization back in the seventh century has been matched in my lifetime by its renewed salience in shaping the contours of the world we live in. And that's just some of the ways in which I've been fortunate. But I think also that underlying all that good fortune is the fact that the, in, the mental habits with which I emerged from my formative years were somewhat different from those of the mainstream of my colleagues in the traditional core of the humanities. Without all the good fortune, those mental habits would have led nowhere. With, it, with that good fortune, they made possible a career in which I was, I think, able to make the best use I could of such talent as I may possess, and thereby achieve what I can happily and gratefully describe as a certain academic fulfillment. So let me end by thanking the Holberg Board. First, for seeing my field, Islamic history, as part of the mainstream of the humanities. And second, for seeing my own rather idiosyncratic way of going about things as a legitimate presence within the big tent of the humanities. Thank you. Thank you.